Oh, you wonder how many goodly creatures are there here? How beauteous mankind is, a brave new world that has such people in it. So there's something otherworldly about the Tempest. There's something natural about the Tempest. Do not to fear. The isle is full of noises. Sounds and sweet airs that give delight and hurt not. Sometimes a thousand twangling instruments will hum about mine ears. And sometimes voices that if, that if I then had waked after long sleep will make me sleep again. In that particular scene, uh, music has just begun playing out of nowhere. And the, the two human characters, Stefano and Trinculo, are terrified because they have no idea what's going on. And Caliban kind of shares that this is a very, this is not an unusual occurrence. And the, the pleasure that he gets from this music is one of the most humanizing moments we have of Caliban. We do p ponder over the description of Caliban as like fish and monster and thinking about what what is Caliban and how and how did you imagine Caliban and how did you imagine he should be on stage right so I often ask my students to think in terms of performance that's one of the questions that I try and get them to ponder over and, and it's amazing how they'll have radically different readings of course some will say no, it's just that he smells bad, or no, he probably is part fish. This is a fantastical story. And that those radically different readings, um, that then they can hash it out together and may, they may not end up in the same place. But I think it shows the kind of the elasticity of the text. I think Caliban's more interesting for me as somebody who is... Uh, coming outside a system who's outside a system that's that's not set up in his favor, right? And so I think what he's trying to do is he's trying to find new ways of using language, using the tools that he has to, to do something else. This is Caliban. He is the monster of the island. Uh, he was there long before Prospero and Miranda and anyone else ever got there. When Prospero comes after he's been banished from Milan, he and Miranda teach Caliban language. Um, and after a few years of a fairly peaceful arrangement, he attacks Miranda and the trust is broken and Caliban is enslaved and feels incredible resentment towards Prospero. Um, and so after the Tempest, when everyone has been shipwrecked on the island, he runs into the drunken butler and the soon-to-be-drunk jester. And he is so in love with their energy and their alcohol and all of that they provide and he decides that they are his new gods and he wants them to rule the island. My favorite moment in The Tempest is actually the moment when Caliban, who's this monster, he's a potential rapist, he does, he threatens all kinds of violence, he actually really he wants to kill Prospero, to be free to Prospero. And there's this moment when he and his band of misfits that he's gathered in order to kill Prospero are together on the island and Ariel appears and starts playing music and Caliban hears the music and he notices that Trinculo and Stefano are, are very much afraid of it and he says to them, be not afeard. And there's a great, great line, be not afeard. And you have to think at that moment of the, the angels at the Annunciation saying to the shepherds, be not afraid. And there's something that's just so grand about it. But he says, he, what he says to Trinculo and Stefano is that the island is filled with this music. And he talks about the ways in which that music gives him so much pleasure. So much so that should it awaken him from a dream, it makes him cry to go back to sleep. And at that moment you think, this is a monster? This is a monster who loves art, loves music, and cries because in his dreams he can actually find a place of peace, a place to be at rest. And I think everything changes about Caliban at that moment. Yes, he is a monster. He does all kinds of bad things. But you know what? So does Prospero. So does Ariel. And there's no one here that's perfect, or there's a way in which to be human is to be imperfect. I think that's what the play gets at profoundly. Miranda and the Tempest interests me because she's a character who is surprised by the world changing around her. Um, and I find her interesting as a character who's endlessly curious about the things that she's experiencing 
and also a little afraid, um, and who doesn't have the answers. Right. Um, I like Miranda as a figure who generates questions um, uh, from people around her. Um, I think the kind of effects that she has on people uh, in the play um, are really uh, intriguing, right? Because she kind of unsettles or disorients people around her. There are rarely like fully evil or fully good characters in Shakespeare. Most of them occupy a fairly gray area. Um, Prospero occupies an extremely gray area, and I feel like he's um, particularly interesting because all of his flaws are very easy for people to identify with, and they're particularly unpleasant ones. They're not the classic, you know, greed, whatever, um, but they're, for example, he wants, he knows what's best for Ariel is to let Ariel be free because that's his natural state, and he's confining him within a human form. Prospero is in a revenge tragedy. He's, he's, Shakespeare's gone all the way back to like the early types of and stuff, the Seneca tragedy. Prospero is in a revenge tragedy, and he is going to get his revenge. The people who ousted him are going to have their comeuppance. And in the middle of it, his daughter falls in love. And, and, he, and he messes with that for a while, but then he sees something there, and I, I think in that we see somebody who's in a tragedy who realizes, but this, this could be a comedy. This could be about unification and forgiveness rather than about revenge and death. And so these, the Tempest, like other things that Shakespeare wrote towards the end of his life, blend that tragedy and comedy and find a place for people like Miranda, which is kind of amazing. Um, and, and, and I think a little more hopeful than, than what we see in the middle of, of Shakespeare's career. Um, and even early on, I, I, maybe Romeo and Juliet is, is, is the turning point to really... Shakespeare doesn't see things as funny, he goes through this tragic period, but then he sort of comes out on the other side and understands the constructiveness of things and maybe the way that we can... Once we understand how constructive things are, maybe we can find a place to operate, even if we're young women. Which is, as a, as a father of a young woman, is, you know, is inspiring to me. The play ends with all of the major characters except Prospero having left the stage. Prospero sends them off into a future that's better than what they thought they were going to get. And then he lingers and admits that he actually can't leave the stage until the audience claps. And he, can't, he cannot be released from that stage space until everybody participates and then he can go. And there's something that's really beautiful about that moment of lingering. I love ending a course with The Tempest. And I think every time that I've taught Shakespeare, I've started with Romeo and Juliet and ended with The Tempest. The Tempest is his last play. And also the reason why I end with The Tempest is because one of the very last lines is the words from Prospero right before his last speech. He says, fare thee well. And it's a goodbye. It's a goodbye to the audience. It's a goodbye to playwriting. It's a goodbye potentially to his own life. Um, and for me, it also becomes a goodbye to the class um, and a goodbye from me to the class and from the class to me. Um, it's a sort of an ending point. And it's also a play that really leaves you on a question mark. It does not resolve neat and tidily. It's one of the most complex plays, one of the most, in a sense, challenging at the level of things don't wrap up. And so I like ending at that because it means Shakespeare's not easy and Shakespeare's not something we can put a bow on. We can't just study Shakespeare for four weeks and be done. Why do we need the humanities? I wouldn't trust anyone who has an answer to that. I just don't think it's an easy to answer question. There's nothing glib you can say about it. Um, there's nothing facile. And I think there's a way in which the humanities teach us that we are imperfect, that we always need to keep searching. We always need to be part of communities. We always need to collaborate. Um, there's a way in which the humanities rebuke the arrogance that we're prone to sometimes. They give us a long history of thinking about what it means to be a human, a monster, a community member, a creator, a destroyer. Um, the humanities are never any one thing and I think that's what their strength is. I think we need the humanities because it helps people to think in ways that we don't normally think. For me, humanities education is at its core, two people and a source. It could be a book, it could be a film, it could be a play. But it's these two people, 
There's not a lot of lab equipment. But you need the connection between those three items, those three very important things, the, the work, the art, the play, and then two people who are, are encountering it and trying to talk about it. I, I hardly know how to speak his words yet, and I will continue to learn for the rest of my life, as we do because he tells about the human condition and we never stop learning about who we are and how it is that we live life and what makes us human. In all of us slingers, a Hamlet or a Richard III or a Miranda or a Calvin, it might sound a bit crazy, but um, Shakespeare probes human psychology and I think that's one of his um, enduring um, characteristics. My parents had lots of books at home and I remember falling in love with Shakespeare when I was about eight years old. We also had a typewriter in our parents' office and when I was in grade school and high school, I would run through the office and I would type a line from Shakespeare on this typewriter so that everybody else in the house could read it. Poetry has this amazing ability to crystallize an experiential moment that you would not be able to hold on to otherwise. And even if it's an ugly, horrible, awful moment, there's something in the way that really good poets can hang on to to the actual human experience of something. A central sensitivity of Shakespeare that I see in, over and over again in different forms is his fascination with the tension between the infuriating complexity of the truth and our intense desire for something that is simple and fundamental and certain. There is almost nothing that an enthusiastic young mind that isn't yet shut down by adult uh, precepts and uh, ideas of what we can't do. There's almost nothing such a young mind can't embrace and, and encompass. I really love Shakespeare because, well, I think, I mean, I've never met him, but I think Shakespeare was a really intelligent guy. I think he really understood mankind and humanity because he really, he's so good at reflecting human nature in his plays. One of the rewards of humanities scholarships is that you ask different questions and you start to see different histories emerge. How do you make decisions? How do you look at situations that are culturally foreign to you? How will you interpret them? What does good judgment look like? How do you make inferences? Those are all skills that are taught in the humanities. I think the humanities are for um, asking the fundamental questions that drive all other kinds of knowledge. So let's say we say, um, uh, how do we decide who's going to be in political power, right? We, we, we're going to make a choice in the voting booth and we're going to have political scientists d decide that. Well, it's humanists, it's philosophers and literary critics who will ask, what is power? How does it work? Who's it for? Those kinds of questions that are about values. And so for me, the humanities is for people who don't love them already. And that a MOOC is to draw people into asking these questions via, say, a literary text, um, but not just to end up with, yes, I appreciate Shakespeare more than I ever did before. I think Shakespeare shows us that we'll, you, we will never know what it is to be human. There's a way in which that's an ideal that we just cannot conform to. Uh, we're fallen creatures. And he wants to look at how complicated everything and everyone is. When you can watch a play for the first time and somebody can say, that's me, that's me, that's me. That's, that's why we do this.